mail. So to go with the presentations that month, and we're really excited with the lineup. We're, we're talking the music and the brain, the mind diet um, and the brain. We're also talking with um, a researcher from the association about the latest um the latest research and where things are heading um, with that and trials and such. And then the first one is actually um, a really interesting presentation with Lego and play and with caregivers. And um, so we're excited to bring these two and I'll make sure that Michelle's got all that to send out to everyone and um, feel free to pass along again. Anyone across the country can attend these. They're all virtual. Looks like we may have our slides ready to go. So Oh, oh, get there. <laughs> Good morning, Nancy. <laughs> you know, it takes a village, right? It does. Thank you all very much for your graciousness and patience with me. I appreciate it. So my hope is that you uh, only see the slide presentations. You don't need all my notes and all of that um, extra stuff. So hopefully that's all you've got on your screens. Okay. Um, again, I just wanted to say thank you to Diane for that nice introduction and thank you everyone for being here today. There's a lot to talk about and it's always nice to be talking with a group of people who have come together for a common cause and today that cause is dementia, which is a fitting topic for the month of May since it's Older Americans Month. I've been asked to basically lay out the landscape for today's webinar, paint the picture, so to speak of what dementia looks like in the United States today under the theme of cultural considerations when diagnosing dementia in diverse and underserved populations. This session will provide an overview of current facts and figures related to dementia with a particular attention to um, Alzheimer's disease. We're going to overlay dementia with the prevalence and magnitude of health and healthcare disparities across racial, ethnic, and other underserved older populations. Understanding the impact of health and healthcare disparities across diverse segments of the older adult population living with dementia is essential for health and mental health care professionals to address barriers to care and optimize outcomes for individuals and their care partners. The bottom line is about ensuring the best quality of care provided to all people living with dementia and maximizing their quality of life. By the end of this presentation, you should be able to not only be up to date with the state of dementia and Alzheimer's disease in the United States, but also be able to understand why it matters, the so what. Why should we care and what can we do about it? So my hope for you is that by the end of this hour, you'll be able to gain familiarity with current US statistics regarding dementia, including Alzheimer's disease, identify health and healthcare disparities across diverse populations living with dementia and their care partners, discuss the impact of those disparities and why they matter, and consider strategies to reduce disparities. Again, it's really about ensuring that the best quality of care is provided to all people living with dementia and maximizing their quality of life. To start with, we wanna look at some of the current facts and figures regarding dementia overall. Estimate, estimates vary, but experts report that more than 7 million people with or over the age of 65 had dementia in 2020. If the current demographic and health trends continue, more than 9 million Americans could have dementia by 2030 and nearly 12 million by 2040. And of course, we know that Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. So we wanna understand the facts and figures specific to Alzheimer's disease as well. This year in 2022, it's estimated that six and a half million Americans age 65 and older are living with Alzheimer's disease. That's one in nine Americans over the age of 65, or almost 11% of the population in this age group. And more than 200,000 of those are affected by early onset Alzheimer's disease. When we look at the breakdown of Alzheimer's by age groups, we see that currently 
27% or 1.75 million Americans between the ages of 65 and 74 have Alzheimer's disease. And more than 37% between the ages of 75 and 84 years old have Alzheimer's. And almost 36% of those over the age of 85 have Alzheimer's. Of those living with, with an Alzheimer's diagnosis, this year, more than 73% are over the age of 75. So the scary thing is that it's highly likely that Alzheimer's disease is underdiagnosed. So outside of research settings, there's a lot of the portion of the population who could meet the diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias and they're not being diagnosed with it. Not only that, but we know that only about half of Medicare beneficiaries who have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or another type of dementia, they're not even told that they have it. So they're not even aware of their diagnosis. So because Alzheimer's disease is often underdiagnosed, and if it's diagnosed by a clinician, people are often unaware of their diagnosis, a large portion, portion of Americans with Alzheimer's may not even know they have it. And this is especially true for underserved and diverse populations, particularly African Americans and Hispanics, who are more often misdiagnosed than their white counterparts. As the number of older Americans grows rapidly, so too will the number of new and existing cases of Alzheimer's disease. This graph shows that the projected change in the number of older adults living with Alzheimer's is expected to more than double between 2020 and 2060, going from 6.1 million to almost 14 million older adults with Alzheimer's disease. In Nebraska, we will see a 14.3% increase between 2020 and 2025 from 30, from, we're going from 35,000 to 40,000 people over the age of 65 living with Alzheimer's in our state. Although there are more whites living with Alzheimer's and other dementias than any other racial or ethnic group in the United States because Whites are the largest racial and ethnic group in the country. Older African-American and Hispanic Americans are disproportionately more likely than older white Americans to have Alzheimer's or other dementias. The group of older adults who for Alzheimer's disease in the coming years will be socially, culturally, and economically different from previous groups of older adults. For example, between 2018 and 2040, the Black older adult population as a whole will increase by 88%, and the Hispanic population of older adults will increase by 175%. Overall in the United States, 19% of Black and 14% of Hispanic adults age 65 and older have Alzheimer's disease compared with about 10% of white older adults. And it's important to consider that racial and ethnic differences in dementia prevalence are also linked to immigrant status. So non-Hispanic white, Hispanic, and other immigrants have higher rates of dementia compared with their US born counterpart counterparts. However, the opposite is true for non-Hispanic Black immigrants who are less likely to have dementia than US-born non-Hispanic African Americans. And it's also important to realize that Hispanics comprise very diverse groups with different cultural histories, different genetic ancestries, and different health profiles. And there's evidence that the prevalence may differ from one specific Hispanic ethnic group to another. So for example, Mexican Americans compared with um, Caribbean Americans. The graph on this slide shows the proportion of Alzheimer's disease broken down by age and race and ethnicity. So as you can see, white older Americans have lower rates of Alzheimer's in all groups. For the young old, between ages 65 and 74, African Americans comprise the highest rates of Alzheimer's disease at more than 
For those between 75 and 84 years old, that proportion jumps to almost 28%, followed by Hispanic populations at almost 20%, and whites at nearly 11%. And for the old, old, those 85 and older, we see even more stark discrepancies in the rates of Alzheimer's disease with black and Hispanic older adults essentially doubling over the rates of whites. In fact, black Americans are twice as likely and Hispanic Americans are one and a half times as likely as non-Hispanic whites to develop Alzheimer's disease. By 2030, which is only like eight years away, nearly 40% of all Americans living with Alzheimer's will be black or Hispanic. Cases among Hispanics will increase seven times over today's estimates and cases among African Americans will increase four times over today's estimates. An increasing diverse older population where where as much as 30% of the population 65 and older will be comprised of racially and ethnically diverse groups by the middle of this century. And that means that not only is the older adult population growing numerically, but within this growing population, the proportion of diverse groups is also growing. And because these underserved and diverse groups have higher rates of dementia, there will be higher rates of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias overall. There are more women than men who have Alzheimer's or other dementias. Almost two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's disease are women. This graph shows that the estimated lifetime risk for Alzheimer's disease at age 45 is approximately one in five or almost 20% for women and one in 10 or a little more than 10% for men. The risks for both sexes are higher at age 65. Of the six and a half million people over the age of 65 in the United States who are living with Alzheimer's disease, four million of them are, are women and two and a half million are men. This represents 12% of women and 9% of men who are over the age of 65. The prevailing reason that there are more women than men living with Alzheimer's and other dementias is most likely the fact that women live longer than men on average and older age is the greatest risk factor for developing Alzheimer's. There is also maybe differences in the reasons um, men and women develop dementia, which might contribute to the lifetime risk of Alzheimer's or other dementias. These differences could be biological, such as chromosomal and, and hormone differences, uh, like those connected to sex differences or differences in, in environmental, social, and cultural influences on men and women, like gender roles and gender differences, or it could be the combination of these factors. Other differences in rates of dementia can be found among geographic areas and living arrangements. So with regard to urban and rural communities, we see that the prevalence of dementia is lower in rural areas versus metropolitan counties. The share of descendants or family members with dementia is lower in rural communities versus metropolitan communities. And survival following dementia diagnosis is lower in rural versus metropolitan counties. With regard to living arrangements, most people with dementia live in the community. They do not live in nursing homes. Uh, however, most people who live in nursing homes have dementia. More than four times as many people with dementia live in traditional community settings, their own home or a residential care setting like assisted living or personal care homes. Among those age 70 and older living in nursing homes, 70% live with dementia. When adult children are available to provide care, a person with dementia is more likely to continue to live at home rather than move to a nursing home. However, where people who have, uh, where people who have dementia live and how they receive care depends partly on their ability to pay, right? So people with higher incomes have, who have dementia are somewhat more likely to live in residential care, which is not covered by Medicare and has a medium median cost of about $50,000 per year. People with lower incomes 
who are living with dementia tend to live at home in the community or in nursing homes. So fewer of them are, are living in residential care settings. Depending on the state, Medicaid for those who qualify may pay a portion of nursing home expenses, which have a median annual cost of more than $90,000. So those with dementia not living in nursing homes who receive care are disproportionately low income, minority, and widowed. There are many factors that have been identified that contribute to higher or lower risks of people developing dementia. Some of these protective and risk factors are listed here on this screen. One protective factor has to do with levels of educational attainment. Older adults with more education are less likely to develop dementia. They spend a larger portion of their lives cognitively healthy and fewer years with dementia. Education gives adults an edge, reducing their dementia risk. Older adults who do not complete high school are three times as likely to experience dementia as those who graduate from college. Less educated older people are more likely to develop dementia and spend more years with the disease than their more educated peers. Currently less than 6% of those age 70 and older who are living with dementia in the US have a college degree and approximately 19% of those um, in this age group living with dementia did not graduate from high school. Another protective factor seems to be marriage. So marriage, um, married older people have a lower risk of dementia than their unmarried counterparts. By contrast, unmarried older adults, including those who are cohabiting, divorced, separated, widowed, or never married, they have significantly higher chances of developing dementia. Divorcees were, are about twice as likely as married people to develop dementia, with divorced men facing a greater risk than divorced women. Additionally, we see that non-Hispanic white adults are less likely to develop dementia than most other racial and ethnic groups. There are two other protective factors listed here on this slide, social engagement and lifestyle. I'm gonna come back to those in just a minute. Um, but with regard to risk factors, we know that dementia prevalence increases with age, meaning that dementia is more prevalent at older ages, particularly those aged 85 and older. We also know, as, dis as discussed earlier, that women are more likely to have dementia than men. Researchers have found several genes that increase the risk of Alzheimer's. So there's a genetic risk factor to Alzheimer's. Um, the APOEE4 gene is the gene with the strongest impact on risk of late onset Alzheimer's disease. And research has shown that between 56 and 65% of folks who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease have one copy of this particular gene and 11% have, have two copies of this particular gene. So it's also been shown that in the frequency of these gene pairings in different racial and ethnic groups that has been shown through research as well. So for example, data show that a higher percentage of African Americans than European Americans have at least one copy of this APOE4 gene pairing. With regard to family history, we know that a family history of Alzheimer's is not necessary for an individual to develop the disease, but individuals who have or had a parent or sibling with Alzheimer's are more likely to develop the disease than those who do not have a first degree relative with Alzheimer's. So those who have more than one first degree relative with Alzheimer's are at even higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Having a parent with dementia increases, um, having a parent with dementia also increases the risk of known genetic risk factors such as that APOE4 uh, gene. So another identified environmental risk factor is air pollution. Exposure to air pollution may be related to dementia risk. 
And a number of different air pollutants have been studied in relation to cognition, cognitive decline and dementia, namely air pollution caused by fuel combustion fuel combustion, fires, and processes that produce dust. How higher levels of long-term exposure to air pollution is associated with worse cognitive declines. Other risk factors for dementia include chronic health conditions and depression and hearing impairments. There are other factors that might contribute to the development or not of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And these factors are considered to be modifiable, meaning that people have some level of control over them. So these are the lifestyle and engagement factors that I mentioned just a minute ago. Although age, genetics, and family history cannot be changed, other risk factors can be changed or modified to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. For example, physical activity, uh, smoking, alcohol use, sleep, education, staying socially and mentally active, blood pressure, and diet. So addressing modifiable risk factors might prevent or delay up to 40% of dementia cases. Caregiving is another significant part of the picture of dementia and dementia care in the United States. Caregiving refers to attending to another person's health needs and their overall well-being. Unpaid family members provide the most care for people living with dementia. Older adults with dementia represent about 10% of people age 65 and older living in residential care and traditional community settings, yet they receive um, a disproportionate share of all unpaid caregiving hours, they receive about 41% 40 of caregiving that's provided by informal caregivers. Um, and those informal caregivers make up about one third of all, all family caregivers. Overall, the largest share of unpaid care out is about 39% for people living with dementia. It's provided by daughters followed by spouses at 25% and sons at 17% and other family and friends at about 20%. So what other characteristics make up the profiles of caregivers or care partners for people living with dementia? Well, we see that approximately two thirds of care partners are women, about 30% are age 65 or older themselves, more than 60% of them are married or living with a partner or in a long-term relationship. And over half of them are providing assistance to a parent or an in-law. And about 10% of them are providing help to a spouse. We see that about two thirds of care partners are white, 10% are black, 8% are Hispanic, and 5% are Asian American. And the remaining 10% represent a variety of other racial or ethnic groups. 40% of care partners have a college degree or more as far as education goes, and 41% have a household income of $50,000 or less annually. About a quarter of care partners are part of the sandwich generation, which means they're not only taking care of their older loved one, but they're also still in the process of raising their own children and have at least one of their own children in the home while providing care to an older relative. 66% of care partners live with the person with dementia in the community. In the United States, more than 11 million Americans provide unpaid care for people with Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. In Nebraska, we've got, we've got 61,000 caregivers who are providing care for people with Alzheimer's disease. 15.3 billion hours of care that's valued at about $355 billion was provided last year in the United States. And by 2050, that's expected to cost more than a mil more than a trillion dollars. Sorry about that. 52 million hours of care in Nebraska, valued at $905 million, was provided to people living with dementia in our state last year. 
the combined costs of nursing home care, paid home care, and the value of unpaid care make up most of these dementia care costs. So between 75 and 84% of the costs are reflected in these statistics. So what does care for people living with dementia entail? Caregiving responsibilities for those living with dementia include not only assistance with activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living, but it also includes things like managing behavioral symptoms of the disease, such as aggression and wandering and repetitive activity. It's also including things that are often overlooked or not acknowledged, like finding and using support services, uh, such as um, support groups or making arrangements for paid in-home nursing, paid in-home care or nursing home care or assisted living care. It also includes assuming additional responsibilities that are not necessarily uh, specific tasks, but there are things like providing overall management of getting through the day and addressing family issues and communication with other family members about care plans it's about decision making and things like that that are not necessarily identified as activities of daily living or instrumental activities of daily living. And it also involves managing other health conditions or comorbidities, such as arthritis or di diabetes or cancer, and providing emotional support and a sense of security for the, the care recipients. When older adults with dementia move into assisted living or other residential care settings, family caregiving doesn't end. 80% of people with dementia living in residential care have at least one unpaid caregiver assisting with their personal care or household activities. Caregivers report several challenges to providing quality of care to their loved ones. And the top challenges for caregivers um, that they report that 69% of them re reported that they did not receive training or information to better prepare as a caregiver. And 50% of them received training too late or during a crisis. And 74% of caregivers received no help or advice from healthcare providers about being a caregiver. In order to improve the quality of care provided by care partners and maximizing the quality of life, for people living with dementia, these challenges really need to be addressed. Alzheimer's disease is also a leading cause of disability and poor health, AKA morbidity in older adults. Before a person with Alzheimer's disease dies, he or she may live through years of morbidity or disability as the disease progresses. As if Alzheimer's or any other type of dementia isn't enough to contend with, nearly nine out of 10 individuals with Alzheimer's or another dementia have at least one other chronic health condition. Additionally, they are more likely than those without dementia to have other chronic conditions. Overall, almost three times more people living with Alzheimer's or another dementia have four or more chronic conditions that those with, than those without dementia. So they're not just dealing with the, the progression of Alzheimer's, they're dealing with other co-occurring health conditions as well. This slide shows the continuum of Alzheimer's disease alone, right? So the Alzheimer's disease continuum shows the progression of Alzheimer's from brain changes that are unnoticeable to the person affected to brain changes that cause problems with memory and eventually physical disability. On this continuum, you can see that there are three main phases, preclinical Alzheimer's disease, mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease, and dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. The Alzheimer's disease phase is further broken down into the stages of mild, moderate, and severe, which reflect the degree to which symptoms interfere with one's ability to carry out everyday activities. So while we know the continuum starts with preclinical Alzheimer's and ends with severe Alzheimer's disease, how long individuals spend in each of the continuum, each, each part of the continuum varies. The length of each phase of the continuum is influenced by age, genetics, biological sex, and other factors, many of which we've already covered. Um, and you'll notice too on this slide that although the arrows in this graphic look 
equal in size, the components of the Alzheimer's disease continuum are not equal in duration. And that's the part that can really vary on an individual level. With regard to those um, with mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease, about 15% develop dementia after two years and about one third develop it within five years. People age 65 and older survive an average of four to eight years after being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Yet some live as long as 20 years. The long duration of illness before death contributes significantly to the public health impact of Alzheimer's disease because much of that time is spent in a state of disability and dependence. A person who lives from age 70 to age 80 with Alzheimer's will spend an average of 40% of their time in this severe stage of Alzheimer's disease. And most of this time will be spent in a nursing home. At age 80, approximately 75% of people living with Alzheimer's disease are in a nursing home compared to only 4% of the general population who are aged 80. In all, an estimated two thirds of those who die of dementia do so in a nursing home compared with 20% of people with cancer and 28% of people dying from other conditions, from all other conditions combined. Unfortunately, those co-occurring health conditions and risks that I mentioned a minute ago are not just experienced by the person living with dementia. Both persons living with dementia and their care partners experience higher rates of co-occurring health conditions than the general population of their peers. So this slide shows, that, uh, shows the percentage of older adults with Alzheimer's with certain co-occurring conditions um, in the graph on the top right. And we see that 46% have a co-occurring diagnosis of coronary artery disease, and 37% also have diabetes, for example. And we know that higher rates of diabetes and obesity are both cardiovascular risk factors for certain types of dementia. The graph in the bottom right, I have, yeah, in the bottom right of the slide shows the percentage of caregivers for those with dementia compared to caregivers for people without dementia and people that aren't providing care to an older person. And you can see that the rates of care partners for people living with dementia are higher for almost every key chronic health condition listed. In Nebraska, we see that 55.6% of caregivers report having at least one chronic health condition. 19.3% also identify as having depression and almost 9% report frequent poor physical health. Some of these chronic health conditions are also experienced more in certain diverse and underserved populations. For example, diabetes is more common among African Americans and hypertension is more common among African Americans and Hispanic Americans than their white counterparts. Some of the other common health conditions experienced by people living with dementia and their caregivers include things like high cholesterol and arthritis and osteoporosis. Many of these health conditions increase the risk for different types of dementias, including Alzheimer's disease. So it's not just that people are having to live with these health conditions and already existing diagnoses of dementia is that those who don't have dementia yet and are dealing with these other health conditions themselves are at a higher risk of, of developing dementia too. So namely their caregivers. So we know that the number of people living with Alzheimer's disease is growing and it's growing fast. However, the burden of Alzheimer's is not equally shared. It's not spread out. Although Alzheimer's and other dementias affect all populations, it occurs at different rates and with different consequences in different groups of, of people. Communities of color and women are disproportionately impacted by Alzheimer's disease. Women are both at higher, are, women are at both higher risk for developing Alzheimer's and are more likely to have caregiving responsibilities. A health disparity 
is when a group of people experience a higher rate of illness, injury, disability, or death um, compared to another group. And a health care disparity refers to differences between groups in health insurance coverage, access to and use of care, and quality of care. Health and healthcare disparities together result in differences that are not explained by variations in health needs, patient preferences, or treatment recommendations, and are closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. Health and healthcare disparities can have a profound negative effect on entire populations or individual communities. Dementia care and support services can vary widely depending on race and ethnicity, geography and social and economic factors, stigma, cultural differences, and um, awareness and understanding about Alzheimer's disease and related dementias can all be factors leading to health disparities. In addition, the ability for a person to get a diagnosis, manage the, the disease, and be able to access quality health care contributes to health disparities. These disparities reach beyond just clinical care. It includes uneven representation of underserved and diverse populations in research clinical trials as well, and those we rely on in order to let us know what best practices are for people living with dementia. Persistent gaps in um, Alzheimer's disease are uh, notable. Racial and socioeconomic disparities in dementia are large and, and persistent. Among Americans between 55 and 69, rates of cognitive limitation are three to four times higher for black people than white people, and seven to 10 times higher for the poorest quarter of the population than the richest quarter. As we mentioned before, Black Americans are twice as likely as non-Hispanic whites to develop Alzheimer's. Hispanics are one and a half times as likely. However, both are less likely to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease than whites are. And when they are finally diagnosed, it's at the later stages of the disease. So when they need more assistance because they have greater cognitive and physical impairment and they need more medical care and caregiving at that point. As a result, African-Americans and Hispanics diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease are substantially more um, likely to use hospitals and physicians and receive more home health services, and they incur substantially higher costs for those services than whites with Alzheimer's. So this slide shows the difference in costs of care for white African-American and Hispanic older adults with dementia. The average per person Medicare payment for African-Americans with Alzheimer's and other dementias were 35% higher than those for whites with, with you know, as compared to those costs, um, whose costs were 7% higher for, for Hispanics than for whites. Non-white populations experience barriers when accessing dementia care. The belief that race or ethnicity will affect the quality of care provided is also highly prevalent. So we see that two thirds of blacks believe that it's harder for them to get excellent care for Alzheimer's disease, along with 40% of Native Americans and 39% of Hispanics. Fewer than half of blacks and Native Americans feel confident that they have access to providers who understand their ethnic and cultural and racial backgrounds. And 62% of Blacks believe that medical research is biased against people of color. And this belief is also held by more than a third of Asian American, Hispanic, and Native Americans. What do disparities look like for people living with Alzheimer's disease? 
One view is represented in the disparities of the cost of various services received by older adults with, with Alzheimer's and other dementias who are of a racially or ethnically diverse population. For example, on this slide, we see that for all service types, hospital care, physician care, skilled nursing care, home health care, and hospice, the cost of care for people of color is noticeably higher than for white people. What do disparities look like for care partners of people living with Alzheimer's disease? Well, research suggests that there may be differences in the stress process in psychosocial outcomes and in variables related to service utilization among caregivers of different racial, ethnic, national, and cultural groups. Caregivers of people with dementia are significantly more likely to experience depression and anxiety than their peers who are not caregivers. Caregivers of spouses with dementia have two and a half times higher odds of having depression than caregivers of people with dementia who are not spouses. 44% of caregivers for people living with dementia report having anxiety. However, white caregivers report caregiving to be more stressful and burdensome and experience higher rates of depression and anxiety than African-American caregivers. White caregivers also report disruptive behaviors to be more stressful than African-American caregivers. Caregivers of individuals with Alzheimer's report more subjective cognitive problems themselves for example, problems with their own memory, and they also experience greater declines in cognition over time than non-caregivers non matched by age and other characteristics. Caring for people with dementia who have four or more behavioral and psychological symptoms, for example, aggression, self-harm, or wandering, seems to be the tipping point for caregivers. These caregivers are more likely to experience more negative emotional reactions to providing care. African Americans tend to have higher levels of what's considered to be resourcefulness or skills used to self-regulate internal or external stressful events than their white counterparts. Compared to whites, African American caregivers typically report greater use of positive appraisals and derive higher levels of day-to-day -day and spiritual meaning from their caregiving experiences. When compared with white caregivers, black caregivers are more likely to provide more than 40 hours of care per week. Black dementia caregivers are found to be 69% less likely than white caregivers to use respite services. Hispanic, black, and Asian American caregivers indicate greater care demands but utilize less outside help and formal services and um, also experience greater depression compared with white caregivers. Cultural values may also influence gender disparities in perceptions of support among caregivers across diverse racial and ethnic contexts. Black and Hispanic, help, um, black and Hispanic participants um, or caregivers rather, compared to whites, generally have poorer health prior to becoming a caregiver for a spouse with dementia than those of similar race or background who did not become caregivers. So, so let me say that again. Black and Hispanic caregivers compared to white caregivers generally have poorer health prior to even becoming a caregiver than their white counterparts. The higher prevalence of Alzheimer's disease in underrepresented racial and ethnic groups compared with whites appears to be due to a higher risk of developing dementia in these groups compared with whites of the same age. This higher risk of Alzheimer's and other dementias appears to stem from variations in medical conditions such as heart disease and diabetes that are more common among Blacks and Hispanics. Um, Health-related behaviors, including some of those modifiable lifestyle uh, factors that we talked about earlier, and socioeconomic risk factors that influence um, some of these genetic risk factors on Alzheimer's. Um, they may also differ by race and 
Uh, they do not account for the large differences in prevalence or incidence among racial groups. Instead, the difference in risk for Alzheimer's and other dementias is explained by disparities in health conditions and socioeconomics and life experiences for people of color compared with older white populations. Having fewer years of formal education is associated with lower socioeconomic status. This in turn may increase one's likelihood of experiencing poor nutrition, decreases one's ability to afford healthcare or medical treatments, and such treatments for cardiovascular disease risk factors that are so closely linked to brain health. And it limits one's access to physically safe housing and employment. Um, not having you know, access to physically safe housing and employment could also increase one's risk of being exposed to substances that are toxic to the nervous system, which are things like air pollution that we mentioned earlier, as well as lead and pesticides. And we know that those are highly correlated with Alzheimer's disease diagnoses as well. In addition, people with fewer years of education tend to have more cardiovascular risk factors for Alzheimer's, including being less physically active, having a higher risk of diabetes, and being more likely to have hypertension and to smoke. And as mentioned earlier, high blood pressure and diabetes risk factors for Alzheimer's and other dementias are more prevalent in the African American community, and diabetes is more prevalent in the Hispanic community. And these conditions, among others, may contribute to greater prevalence of Alzheimer's among these diverse groups. Characteristics of healthcare systems that contribute to disparities should also be acknowledged. These include implicit bias on the part of healthcare providers, including ageism, sexism, and racism. Cultural and language barriers can also hinder patient provider relationships. As the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease increases, so does the need for additional members of the paid workforce who are involved in diagnosing, treating, and caring for those living with the disease. We see workforce shortages across professional disciplines. 55% of primary care physicians, however, say they are not, there are not enough dementia care specialists in their communities to meet patient needs. In Nebraska, we see that we have 23 geriatricians for the entire state. There's a 265.2% increase needed to meet the demand in 2050. We have 10,620 home health and personal care aides, and we need a 22% increase in order to meet the demand of home health and personal care aides by 2028. The number of geriatricians needed in 2050 to serve just 10% of those over the age of 65 are 84. So we have 23 right now. We need 84 by 2050 just to be able to meet the demand of 10% of our older adult population in Nebraska living with dementia. Um, we also need if we just wanted to be able to meet the need of 30% of our older population with dementia in Nebraska, we would need 253 geriatricians by 2050. And that's not even to meet the full demand. Nationally, we will have to nearly triple the number of geriatricians to effectively care for the number of people projected to have Alzheimer's in 2050 and the demand for direct care workers like nurses aides, home health aides, home care workers, the, the paid formal caregivers, that's projected to grow by more than 40% between 2016 and 2026, while their availability is expected to decline. And it's not just numbers of professionals, it's also about the lack of training. So few care professionals specialize in geriatrics. Only 12% of nurse practitioners have special expertise in gerontological care. Less than 1% of registered nurses, physician assistants, and pharmacists identify themselves as specializing in geriatrics. And only 4% of social workers have formal certification in geriatric social work. 
In fact, half of primary care physicians report that they do not feel adequately prepared to care for individuals with Alzheimer's and other dementias. More than 25% report being only sometimes or never comfortable answering patient questions about Alzheimer's or other dementia. Probably the biggest uh, factor that contributes to these healthcare disparities and health disparities is discrimination. Although we have known that genetics and family history and chronic health conditions and age affect the prevalence and incidence rate of Alzheimer's disease and other dementia, dementias, it's only been more recently that we've acknowledged the impact of other social and environmental factors. Social and environmental disparities, including lower levels and quality of education, higher rates of poverty, and greater exposure to adversity and discrimination increase risk for these chronic conditions. Um, especially among Black and Hispanic populations, discrimination and that exposure to ad adversity has a, a much higher risk for dementia across these populations. These health and socioeconomic disparities are rooted in the history of discrimination against Black and other people of color in the United States. And this is what structural racism is all about. And structural racism influences environmental factors such as where people can live, the quality of schools in their communities, and exposure to harmful toxins and pollutants like we talked about earlier. It also influences sociocultural factors such as access to quality healthcare, employment prospects, occupational safety, the ability to pass wealth to subsequent generations, treatment by the legal system, and experienced violence. Structural racism impacts many aspects of life that may directly or indirectly alter the ability to adhere to healthy behaviors or access resources that influence dementia risk. So you can see on this slide, that discrimination is a barrier to Alzheimer's and dementia care. And these populations reported discrimination when seeking health care, 50% of Black Americans, 42% of Native Americans, and more than a third of Asian and Hispanic Americans. Hey, Dr. So, Kelly, this is Michelle jumping in here. Just, um, just noting the time, it's 10 o'clock, so we have about 10 minutes left, and we do have some questions popping into the Q&A also, just so you know. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to um, speed this up a little bit and wrap it up. We just want to um, think about, you know, why does this all matter? So what? It matters because individuals are impacted by Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, right? So Alzheimer's is a leading cause of death, death among older adults. And um, even given COVID, this has been a, a, a huge leading cause of death for, for people over the age of 65. We also know that it matters because, um, you know, Alzheimer's is more than just memory loss, it kills, right, like I just said, but these are, these are not just numbers, these are people, people with names, people that we might know, these are our loved ones, these are our family members, our friends, our neighbors, they're not just our patients or clients, they're people that we know, and they might be ourselves one day. So that individual impact is why it matters. It also matters because of the impact on families. It's an increase in caregiving. It's an increase of, of costs. It's an increase of um, concern about their own health and well-being. And we know that caregivers are not able to provide the best quality of care to their loved ones if they're not healthy themselves. It's also important because it impacts our healthcare system. So we see major uh, costs can, that affect um, our Medicare and Medicaid spending, as well as people's out-of-pocket expenses. And this makes, um, you know, contributes greatly to uh, the health and well-being of our society as a whole. And so what can we do to make a difference? Well, we need to, um, you know, continue to work on um, 
our own awareness and cultural competency. If we wanna reach the goal of reducing health and healthcare disparities, we need to understand how and why many diseases affect these diverse communities in different ways, because this is crucial for identifying tailored treatments and prevention methods for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, as well as developing evidence-based practices to support care partners. Um, and how do we do this? Well, as professionals, we have to encourage our patients and clients to be vigilant and not allow for complacency. As a society, we must continue to strive to eliminate structures which perpetuate and maintain racism. We also have to identify and support self-care strategies that are necessary to cope with and survive societal inequity and racism. Um, you know, given their own experiences with the discrimination, it's not surprising that non-white racial and ethnic populations feel it's important for Alzheimer's and dementia care providers to be more culturally competent. And the key elements of cultural competence um, that we should strive for are very much in line with recommendations from the Alzheimer's Association um, as far as what they suggest um, that paths to create paths to move forward and um, they align with, you know, the, the elements of cultural competence are culturally diverse staff that reflects the population being served, the ability to overcome language barriers, either with bilingual staff or interpreters. It involves training for providers on the cultures and languages represented in the population, and it includes patient materials and uh, practice signage that are translated and sensitive to cultural norms. So, um, you know, in addition to all of what we do as pro healthcare professionals, we need help from the federal government to increase investment into communities that are disproportionately impacted by Alzheimer's. We need help from policymakers, and we also need to be developing culturally appropriate assessment um, tools to accommodate for diverse and underserved populations, and we need to include more uh, participants in clinical research and trials that represent these diverse and underserved communities so that we can build those better assessment tools and um, interventions that are effective with different population groups. Although much has been accomplished, there's still much to be done. We have our work cut out for us, but the bottom line is still all about doing our best to ensure the best quality of care provided to all people living with dementia and maximizing their quality of life. So I know I kind of raced through the end there, but hopefully we were able to accomplish our goals of gaining familiarity of the, the current statistics and facts and figures about the dementia population in our country and what those health and healthcare disparities look like and what we can do about it. So with that, um, I do have, you know, obviously my reference slides are here and my contact information. If we run out of time and you want to contact me with things that we don't get to, um, it is here. But with that, that is all I've got for you today. And I thank you for your time and attention. And if there's some questions I can try to answer now, I will try. I'll do my best. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Dr. Kelly, if you want to stop screen sharing um, so we can see you better. And um, you should be able to just click on your Q&A there at the bottom of the screen so you can see the questions that have popped in. Uh, you have seven of them, so and not too much time left. So, And I know we started a little bit late, so we'll just try and roll through these as quickly as possible and stay on schedule, okay? Okay, I'll do my best. Okay. So should I try all of them or should I just... Um, yep, just choose. start at the top and okay. just... Um, yep, and then... Okay, so can you say more about people not being told they have Alzheimer's. I think you said some on Medicare aren't told. Um, so this is from Sheila. Thank you for that question. What uh, information we have is based on um, Medicare recipients, right? So that's maybe not all of our dementia population, um, but we, we, are, we know that when people have been surveyed they, and they're Medicare recipients, they are not aware of their Alzheimer's diagnosis. Um, and a lot of that probably is because the physicians are afraid to tell them. They're not comfortable talking about it. They are, for whatever, you know, they're, they're not trained in those areas as some of the other things I talked about today were um, alluding to. So um, I think it was that 
more than 50% of Medicare recipients that had um, payments going out for treatment and services related specifically to an Alzheimer's diagnosis. Those are the folks who didn't know that they were, um, that they had that diagnosis. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, again, you can contact me and I can send you some of the links with more information if that would be more helpful. In regards to divorce as a risk factor, is there any research on couples who have to live separately due to one needing a higher level of care? And that's a question from Jennifer. That's a good question. I am not sure to be honest with you. Um, I didn't run across that specifically while putting this together, but there may well be some information regarding that. And again, if you contact me offline, I'd be glad to help find more information about that to help answer that question. Um, another question from Wendy says, um, thank you, I appreciate it. Your question is, why is being married a protective factor, but long-term cohabitation is not? Has there been any specific studies about same-sex relationships? Both very, very good questions. Um, I know that marriage, whether you have dementia or not, is um, a contributing factor to longevity. So people who are married live longer, um, and it is apparently a protective factor for um, uh, de dementia. I don't know why there is a difference between marriage and cohabitation. Um, so I was wondering that when I was putting it together myself. I'm curious to look into that. And I am sure that there is probably um, some studies that have been done on same-sex relationships and especially around caregiving um, and, you know, um, partner relationships. I didn't have time, obviously, to include that in this uh, presentation, but I do believe that there is some emerging um, research in that area. And again, contact me offline and I would be happy to send you some information and resources about that. What is contributing to these discrepancies in costs? That is a question from Jennifer. Um, I assume you mean caregiving costs, or maybe it's um, like costs of that are paid out through Medicare for like nursing homes or things. Um, I'm not sure which discrepancies in costs you're referring to. Um, I think a lot of it you know, kind of boils down to, that one's a little hard for me to answer because I'm not sure which costs you're referring to. So we can maybe come back to that one, or again, let's chat offline and I can give you more direct information. Jason's got a question about what drives the cost disparities between different ethnic, ethnic groups. I guess that's the same thing. Um, a lot of it has to do with those um, differences in um, you know, when you delay care because you've had a delayed diagnosis of the disease, of Alzheimer's or dementia, you're in a um, worse state of health, I guess, and, and greater disability. So the costs of care are going to be more expensive than if you were able to, um, you know, have early intervention or earlier diagnoses so you could have more preventative or more maintenance care provided for it. So I think that's a big part of why we see some of those health and healthcare disparities. Um, but again, it's probably a combination of different factors. So um, I think Julie jumped on, so I think that's a sign that my time is up. There's just a couple other questions, and I really encourage you to connect with me offline, and I will do my best to chat with you and give you more references. Yes, thank you, um, Dr. Kelly. That was a wonderful presentation. And there are just a few more and uh, she can reply to those um, offline as well. So thank you for being willing to do that. We are gonna take a short break. We will be back at 1020. So you can um, just leave your link up and come back and we'll get started right at 1020. Thank you.